Good morning, everyone. It's great to see all of you out this morning uh, for our lecture series on a history of Western thought, why we think the way we do. My name is Ross Arnold. I'm pastor of Lakeside Presbyterian Church, which is why we're meeting here. Today. I know many of you know who I am. If you don't know who I am, I'm pastor. But um, if you don't know anything about why I'm doing this, a lot of my background has been both in philosophy, philosophical theology, systematic theology, in terms of my, own, my formal studies, but also a lot of work in history. And uh, people have already been asking about the videotape, you'll notice the camera here. Uh, we do have, or we will have, all of the videotape lectures online, and they're free of charge. You can watch them, review them, in case you miss any, you can pick them up. This video should be up by the end of the weekend, that is the end of Sunday. Uh, maybe up before that, but don't count on it. My wife Carolyn uh, is very diligent about getting these things up, and it takes some time to do that. In addition to this lecture series, there are four other series that are available online. The last lecture series I did as part of what's called the eight-week series is um, World Religions, because I firmly believe I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian pastor, but I think in order to have integrity, in order to be able to be really confirmed and convinced in what you believe, you need to know what other people believe, and we need to do that respectfully. So those lectures are already online. Uh, in addition to that, there are three series of lectures that I have done on cruise ships. Some of you, I, you know, I see, uh, <laughs> hi Gary, I see you all sitting here. Um, I did three lecture series, one called Footsteps of Faith in the Eastern Mediterranean, and then two on a, um, cruise ships called um, The Wonders of Arabia. And that, those include everything from ancient civilizations in the Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean, to a lecture about Lawrence of Arabia in the First World War, to lectures about Egypt, and all kinds of stuff. All of that is available if you're interested. But these, again, will be up. Those are to be found on our Lakeside Institute of Theology website. We have an institute here as well, as well as our church. That's www.litchapala.org. L-I-T-Chapala.org. I'll have that information for you later if you'd like to see that. And Invite your friends to come next week if you're interested, if they're interested, because they can always pick up the one they, the first one that they missed online and then flow from there. In a few minutes, I'm going to talk some about what we're going to be doing in, in terms of the schedule for these lectures, but I want to jump right into it with some conversation. Um, in terms of a history of Western thought, we obviously live here early in the 21st century. And it's been said that we are a culture that is addicted to sound bites. You know what a sound bite is, right? It's just a really short little clip that you can capture and use it on TV especially or radio. Another way of thinking about that is that we are a culture that um, loves bumper stickers. You don't see them so much down here, but in the States there are bumper stickers for everything. It seems like we're addicted to various kinds of catchy sayings, short, pithy. I want to look at some of those this morning as a way to get us started because I believe that these sound bites, these bumper sticker kinds of slogans, reflect something very serious about what we think of as a culture. And when I talk about the culture, and I'm going to talk about a little bit uh, further into this, what we're going to be dealing with and what we're not going to be dealing with, but in terms of Western culture, we have all kinds of these catchy sayings or sound bites or bumper sticker sayings that we use all the time. For instance, people will say, that may be true for you, but it isn't true for me. Famous story about um, Jane Fonda, back when she was Hanoi Jane, this was a long, long time ago, during the end of the Vietnamese War, or the Vietnam War. Um, she was on the Dick Cavett show, you remember Dick Cavett? Yes. And the other guest that night was the Archbishop of Canterbury, Jane Fonda, the Archbishop of Canterbury. And Jane Fonda said to the Archbishop of Canterbury, well, that may be, it, it may be true for you, Archbishop, but it's not true for me that Jesus is the Son of God. And the Archbishop said, well, either it's true or it isn't. And yet we say, it may be true for you, but it isn't true for me. People will say, it doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you believe it with your whole heart. This is one I, I just heard on a TV show the other night. My will determines my reality. Whatever I will becomes reality for me. It all depends on what you mean by that or how you define that. We had a president not too many years ago that that was a very famous kind of thing that came out. Um, the end justifies the means. Don't sweat the small stuff, and it's all small stuff. Question authority. Now, these are just a few samples, and I want to ask, what are we really saying? 
Now, I'm not suggesting that there are not some things that are true about these, but I also believe that there are deeper underlying kind of things that may be being reflected in our culture that we aren't even aware of anymore. My point is, when we ask what are we really saying, words matter. Because words reflect thoughts, and how we think matters. Our thoughts directly affect our actions. In fact, it's been said that dogma begets ethics. I'll look at that later. Dogma, meaning what you believe, begets ethics, how you act. Words matter because they reflect thoughts. Thoughts direct our actions. And all of those things together create for each of us a worldview. Worldview means our overall point of view about life, how we see and understand the world. And my premise here is that these kind of little sound bites, more than we may realize, may reflect something about what we really believe is true about the world and our place in it. And it's also true that most of us assume that our worldview, that is the way I see the world, is the correct one. That my perspective is the only one that really makes sense and is correct. And anybody who doesn't agree with that is either misguided or stupid. Now, you may not say it in those crass terms, but too many, too, many, too many people think that way. They're not even willing anymore to listen to somebody who has a different point of view. Have you seen that in our culture? Yeah. I, I have very much seen it in some of my teaching and things. And in terms of words matter, I think those of us who are Americans understand from the current political scene that things people say have an impact. And so we need to ask, are we right in our assumptions about our worldview? Or do we need to be more thoughtful, more critical about the things we believe and the things we say? Because it has an effect on what happens in our world. I did a version of this talk, uh, quite a bit different than this one, but a basic version, in a Christian context for a church in the past, and I called it, What's Wrong with the World? Because I believe that there are some things that we look around and go, what is going on in the world today, right? <laughs> I think some of it may be our lack of awareness about what it is we think and say. We've lost critical thinking, and I'll talk about that. But I want to give you some more. Um, well, let, let me do this first. One of the things that all of these reflect is something that we might, from a philosophical point of view, call subjective relativism. All that means, subjective means it's all about me and what I think. Relative, relativism means that, that may be different for someone else or it may be different in a different circumstance. It's all relative, right? So subjective relativism means that truth, meaning, and morality are not absolutes, but they are relative, meaning depending upon the person and the circumstance, and they are subjective to what I think. Belief is all that matters and all beliefs are equally true. I've had people say, well, you can't tell me that you think I'm wrong. Well, yeah, if I think you're wrong, I need to be respectful. I need to respect the fact that other people have different ideas. But we've gotten this muddle-headed idea that everybody has to be right. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on. The idea that everyone is equally right is irrational. It is contrary to the most basic laws of thought, of rational thought, particularly the second law of thought, which is the law of non-contradiction. Something cannot both be true and not true at the same time in the same way. That's a basic law of rational thought. If I say something is true, you say it's not true, we may both have the right to say that, but we can't both be right. And we've gotten, again, so muddle-headed, we think everybody gets to be right. No one has the right, we believe in subjective relativism, no one has the right to tell me what is right or what I should do, because nothing ultimately matters anyway. This is where our culture has gotten to as a predominant worldview. And we're going to be talking about that over the next several weeks. Again, now I want to give you some others. Um, if it feels good, do it. This, was, this came out during the sexual revolution, you know, back in the middle of the 20th century. And seeing is believing. These two, while there is some truth to them, all of these have some truth to them, taken to their extreme, these both reflect materialism. Materialism is the belief that we are just animals, that the physical world is all that exists, there's no such thing as, as spiritual, there's nothing beyond the current physical world, and because of that, the physical world is all that's real, pleasure dictates morality, and reality is entirely based upon sense experience. 
You can imagine what that does to any belief in God, or even any belief in non-material things like honor and trust and loyalty and love. Where do you go with those if you're a pure materialist? We also have sayings like, a mind is a terrible thing to waste, which was the slogan for, and still is the slogan for, the United Negro College Fund, which is great. I, I'm a huge believer in education, and I believe that's true. We also see knowledge is power, and there's an extent to which that is true. But when we carry those to an extreme, which I think we do, they reflect rationalism. Rationalism is the, the belief that reason is the only valid source of truth or knowledge. That using reason is the only way to find any truth. And so the most important part of any person is their mind. Instead of a mind is a terrible thing to waste, why isn't a life is a terrible thing to waste? Because I believe there's more to people than just their minds. But a pure rationalist doesn't. We also have things like he who dies with the most toys wins, it's a popular bumper sticker it used to be, and living well is the best revenge. These reflect an attitude which I would call commercialism. You might call it materialism, but philosophically speaking, materialism means something else. So commercialism, the idea that life is measured in economic terms. My value is defined by what I have. Do I have a better paying job, a bigger house, a faster car, more expensive clothes? That is very much a commercialism kind of approach to life. He who dies with the most toys wins. We also get things like carpe, carpe deo, seize the day. And I think that if that, if that motivates people to, to get busy, get active, do positive, productive things, then that's great. Um, to quote, uh, is it Stephen Stills? Better to burn out than to fade away. Life, live fast, die young, leave a beautiful corpse. You ever heard that one? One version of that is uh, live fast, die young, leave clean underwear. But <laughs> That was quoted by a mother, I think, who was worried their kids might die in a car accident or something, and they think they're terrible mothers. These reflect what we might call temporalism. The idea that youth is everything, and now is all you've got. There isn't a future. There isn't an eternity. It's all right now. So do it now, or you're not going to get a chance. We also have sayings like, life is hard, and then you die. Or, whatever can go wrong will. I always get the worst line. Right? How many times do we say that? These reflect versions of nihilism, which, which is a, a doctrine of despair. The idea that nothing has meaning and everything is hopeless. My line is always the slowest line. You know, um, life is hard and then you die. My, my sister-in-law's aunt, who raised her, used to say, live and learn, and die and forget it all. <laughs> you know, that's a, even though it's lighthearted, we laugh, and again, there's some truth in each of these. They do reflect something deeper. Um, the last section here, that may have been true for our parents, but it's not true now, and don't be so old-fashioned. Those reflect what you might call chronocentrism. The idea that today is better than yesterday. We're smarter than anybody ever was before. We are better than, people are better now than they used to be. Human progress and perfection is inevitable. Really? We really think that our that people today and the world we live in today is inherently better somehow than in the past? There's a chronocentrism. It's got to be better because it's now, <laughs> not then. All of these are kind of uh, their worldview approaches. And we're going to talk about those in more detail as we get into this lecture series. But you might say, so what is the question? Why am I talking about bumper sticker slogans? Why am I talking about these sound bites? What's the point behind them? Well, my point is, I believe we no longer know where our ideas come from. Even these, these witty, could be bumper sticker kind of thoughts, we never think about what they mean. We don't think critically about anything. We no longer know how to determine what is real, what is good, what is true, and what is good. Now, the thing we don't realize is, we used to teach children, when I say used to a long time ago, we used to teach children how to think critically about these things. In fact, a classical education, which I'm very grateful a lot of schools are beginning to return to what's called a classical education. A classical education had seven liberal arts. You've heard of the liberal arts, right? Well, there are seven of those, and they're broken up in two sections. The first level, which students would learn when they first entered a classical education system, was called the trivium. 
And because this was what young kids learned, this is what the beginning was. Trivium has the same root as our word trivial or trivia. But trivium means three. The three basic things that students were taught in a classical education was grammar, logic, and rhetoric. What does that mean? Grammar means learning how language works, how it's constructed, and therefore how you can draw meaning out of it. How you can read thoughtfully and critically, for instance. The second, logic, means to be able to think critically and develop arguments, to be able to figure out whether something that's being said to you is true or not. It is to think philosophically and critically. And the third is rhetoric. Rhetoric is communications. It's the ability to then communicate the things you know, or arguments particularly, not in the sense of antagonistic, but just to present a case for something, is rhetoric, communication. So we learned language, what it means and how to use it. We learned logic, how to think critically about things. And we learned rhetoric, how to communicate well. We don't do any of those things anymore. And then the next four of the liberal arts, what was called a quadrivium, were arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy, much of which had to do with learning how to think abstractly. Music is a great abstraction, which we then manifest as a real thing in the world. So those seven classic liberal arts taught young people how to think about things, how to think critically, how to decide what is real, what is true, and what is good. Now we're talking about philosophers in this course. I promise that I will not overwhelm you with a lot of detail kind of stuff. This is about as complicated as it's going to get. But when we ask those three questions, the question of how do we know what is real is the question of metaphysics. That's what metaphysics is, is the examination of what is real. The question of what is true is called epistemology in philosophy. How do we know anything? Particularly, how do we know if it's true or not? And how do we know what is good? In philosophy, it's called axiology, or the philosophy of ethics. We have developed ways to think about this. Metaphysics addresses what is real. Epistemology addresses what is true. Axiology, or ethics, addresses what is good. But we don't even do those things anymore. And so it's no wonder we've lost the ability to decide what is real, what is true, what is good. In fact, Alistair uh, McIntyre, a Scottish philosopher, one of the foremost ethics philosophers of the 20th century, he wrote a wonderful book called After Virtue. He said, we have very largely, if not entirely, lost our comprehension, both theoretical and practical, of morality. How has that happened? It's because we no longer can decide what is real, we no longer can decide what is true, and most especially, we no longer can make good decisions about what is good or not good. How have we gotten so confused? How have we gotten to this place? We have lost the ability to think critically about the things in our lives. And as I said earlier, dogma, what we believe, begets ethics, how we act. How we think, what we believe, controls how we act. I believe that what we're experiencing in the Western culture and all the things, whether we can put our finger on it or not, we all have a sense that there are things going wrong. What is wrong with our world today? Have you not said that at some time or another? I believe what we're experiencing in the Western culture is the end result, or the, the, the end stage of a process that's taken at least 350 years and is based upon things even older than that, that has changed and shaped how we think and what we believe. And I'm not talking about religious beliefs, I'm talking about what we decide is true. Whether that's religiously, philosophically, you know, um, cosmetically, whatever. And I believe that we need to identify ways of thinking that have brought our culture into trouble. Where did these ideas come from? I said earlier that people assume, most people assume, without actually articulating it, most people assume that their worldview, their way of looking at the world, is the only one that really makes sense. That's the way all smart people think about it, without realizing that almost everything I just said, all those little bumper sticker slogans, and most of our major, the major ideas in our worldview, came from somebody else. It's not just common sense. Somebody made this stuff up, folks. And until we know where these things come from and how they relate to one another, how they have built 
to bring us to this place in our culture, our society in the West, we are not going to be able to think critically and decide which of those things ought we really be, should we be saying and what ought we to be believing about what is real, what is true, and what is good. We need to identify those things, understand them better, so that we'll have a better idea of what we should think and how we should act. Does that make sense? How do we know what is real, what is true, and what is good? Now, philosophy gets a very bad rap, just like history gets a very bad rap. How many of you all have been in some of the classes that I've talked about history? Okay. Is it fun? Yeah. I have people all the time telling me, man, do more history. And yet those are the same people that tell me I hated history in school. Because you can do anything well or you can do it poorly. Well, philosophy can be done well or it can be done poorly. It can be done in a way that you really see how it applies to your life. Or it can be done in a way that you think, why in the world would we talk about these things? Philosophy means, quite literally, the love of wisdom. The love of wisdom. Phileo sophos. The love of wisdom. And philosophy is, at its core, a critical examination of our foundational beliefs about anything. You might take as a definition that philosophy is an attempt to think rationally and critically. And that doesn't mean a negative. It just means deciding yes or no to think rationally and critically about life's most important questions in order to obtain knowledge and wisdom about them. Because ideas matter. Because what you think affects how you act. So philosophy is great stuff. Now, this is our schedule for these classes. Today, we are doing sort of the introduction and I'm going to be talking about faith. Now, not faith necessarily in terms of the religious view of faith, although two of the people I'm going to talk about today, very briefly, are, were religious. They were theologian philosophers, Augustine and Aquinas. But these come from the time, Aquinas is sort of just outside this, but is relative to it, uh, relevant to it. It's called the Age of Faith, prior to the Enlightenment, prior to the Age of Reason. So today we're going to talk about faith, and how particularly Plato and Aristotle started a way of thinking, very different ways of thinking, that have directly led us down to the future, that have dictated to a great extent what we now believe, how we think about things. And as we go through all of this, next week, same time, same place, we'll talk about reason, using Rene Descartes, John Locke, and David Hume. And if you don't know who those people are, you will by the time we're done. And um, then experience, Immanuel Kant, and Friedrich Schleiermacher. Everyone say, Friedrich Schleiermacher. Okay. Schleiermacher was a, a theologian, and from a Christian point of view, he messed everything up. But it's very <laughs> important to our culture. Then process, looking at Hegel, Karl Marx, Darwin, and Alfred North Whitehead. On September 9th, we will not have a lecture. Because uh, Carolyn and I will be in Wisconsin to celebrate her father's 104th birthday. <laughs> yes, based on her genetics, I told Carolyn she's going to be at least 40 years without me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, her dad, I keep saying, we don't expect to have him around with him another 15 or 20 years, so we need to see him when we can. Uh, <laughs> on September 16th, we will talk about will using Machiavelli, William James, and Friedrich Nietzsche on the 23rd, Meaning and Meaninglessness, talking about Ludwig Wittgenstein, the logical po positivists, and Jacques Derrida and deconstruction. If you don't know anything about what those things mean, great, you're in the right place. Now, um, and then finally, where do we go from here? Now, I promise this is not going to be too technical. You do have to think. You can't even say philosophy without having to think about something. And that's part of our problem is we've forgotten how to think about things. So I will call on you to think, but it's not going to be overly technical. I am only dealing with Western philosophers. Those of you who were in our last lecture, my last lecture series, you know that I deal with Eastern religions. And so I've had some exposure to that. But we're not talking about that here. We're talking about Western culture, Western thought. So no Eastern uh, philosophy is going to come into it. And I'm not going to deal, obviously, with all the Western philosophers. There are thousands of them. And I'm not even dealing with some of my favorites. I've only picked of those that I think specifically we can identify how they've affected how we think, how Western culture thinks. 
And you may be free, free to disagree. You may say, oh, you missed a really important one. You know, you should have put Jean-Paul Sartre in there, or you should have put Pascal in, or somebody else. But you're right, I should have. But this is what we're going to deal with. And we're going to deal with why philosophy is important. Okay? Any questions about that? That's where we're going with this. And the people I've chosen are based upon these, which I think are major kind of themes in thinking that have brought us to where we are. And where we are is a pretty dark place. Jacques Derrida, who died in 2004, basically said, nothing has any meaning, you might as well give up. Okay, we'll explain all that as we go along. And a lot of this has very practical application to the real world. If any of you all have technical philosophical backgrounds, by the way, you're going to be very disappointed if you really have studied this stuff, because I'm just going to be skating across the surface. I can't get into a lot of detail with this many people and this many ideas. But how many of you all have been to Seattle and seen the EMP building, the Experience Music Project? Have you seen it? It looks like this big pile of uh, colored aluminum foil, right? Or the um, Frank Gehry's Bilbao Museum, where nothing is a straight line, right? Those are architectural manifestations of the theories of deconstruction that Jacques Derrida and Lorty and the others came after him developed. It is a practical application of a philosophical approach in architecture. We'll talk about that. And um, if you don't know what those buildings look like, think about them. If you think that nothing really, nothing squares, so to speak, then those buildings reflect that. Okay? All right. If there's no other questions, let me jump into some more stuff here. We still have a half an hour. I'm going to... I give you this just as a background. I mentioned that today we're talking about faith, not necessarily in terms of religion, because we're talking about philosophers. A lot of the best philosophers have been theologians, and a lot of the best theologians have been philosophers, but it's not exactly the same thing. Um, the four major div historical divisions of philosophy, there is classical philosophy, which was from 600 BC or so, the early Greek philosophers, to about 480, about 1,000 years. This is the beginning of Western philosophy, especially the classical Greek and Roman philosophers, and it's, it was because they looked up at the world in wonder and said, how, how do we explain this? What's this all about? Notably, the three great Greek philosophers, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, I'm going to talk about two of those today. Socrates, I'm not going to get into because we have no writings of Socrates, because Socrates didn't believe in writing. Socrates said if you wrote things down, you would forget them. And so he didn't believe people should write. The things we know about Socrates, we know entirely because of Plato, who was his student, who did write down Socrates' ideas. But most, most scholars today believe that most of what Plato attributed to Socrates are actually Plato's ideas. All right? We then have medieval philosophy from 400 to about 1400 AD. You'll notice these are about 1,000-year periods at this point. Uh, during medieval times, the Middle Ages, the church, the Christian church was dominant and expressed a philosophical but Christian understanding of the world. Notably, to the first two I'm going to talk about today, Augustine, St. Augustine, and Thomas Aquinas, but also you might consider Anselm, Duns Scotus, or William of Ockham. You've heard of Ockham's razor, the philosophical argument that basically says the simplest answer is almost always right. William of Ockham was the philosopher who came up with that, with that, but he was a churchman as well. I'm not going to deal with Scotus, Ockham, or Anselm. Uh, then the Renaissance, and into the modern era, about a, about a 500 year period, that knowledge explodes. This is the time of the great growth of science and reason, the supreme methods of discovery and knowledge, noticeably Blaise Pascal, one of the great guys ever. Um, uh, Rene Descartes, we'll talk about later. John Locke, we'll talk about. Berkeley, David Hume, Immanuel Kant, Hegel, and Kierkegaard. We'll be talking about Descartes, Locke, Hume, Kant, and Hegel along the way. And then modern times from 1900 on, contemporary philosophy is the most diverse. It goes in a million different directions, but I think there's sort of consistent sub-themes under all of it, of all of the different philosophical movements. Notably, noticeably, William James we'll talk about. Wittgenstein will talk about, Heidegger no, Sartre no, Camus no, Searle no, and Plantinga no, but we will talk about some of those modern philosophers as well. Any questions about that? I want to talk for a few minutes now about four philosophers in the next half hour, and what their major, only their major themes were, because these guys were unbelievably prolific, all four of them. And so, 
we'll talk about just the major themes. The first one is Plato. Again, Socrates is considered the first of the great Greek, well, that's not true. There are a lot of great Greek philosophers. You know, Pythagoras uh, and, and others influenced Socrates, influenced Plato and whatnot. But Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle are head and shoulders above the others. But we don't know a lot directly about Socrates. Plato we look to as being perhaps one of the three most important philosophers that ever lived. He um, is influential in the development not only of philosophy, but in science, mathematics, political philosophy, religion, and spirituality. In fact, uh, Nietzsche, you know, the nihilist, cynic Nietzsche, said that Christianity is just uh, is Platonism for the common people. Because modern Christian thought, modern Western religious thought of various kinds, come, can trace some of their themes right back to Plato. We'll talk about that a little bit when we get to Augustine. He founded the Academy in Athens, which was the first Western institution of higher learning anywhere ever. And he invented the process called dialectic, in which he would ask a question, students would respond, and that they would have a conversation about it. Plato created that. He was a student of Socrates, and he was the teacher of Aristotle. Pretty good connections. I never get phone calls. <laughs> but... Okay. Uh, I'm glad you can hear that. Um, by the way, turn off your cell phones. <laughs> so, Plato, again, um, he can be seen as the mathematician poet or the mathematician philosopher. Poetry and philosophy have always been intertwined. Plato distrusted the senses. Plato, Plato looked around at the world, he said, you know, everything changes. It gets old, it decays. Things burn and there's only ash left. Everything changes. So what we're looking at, what we're experiencing with our senses, can't be the ultimate reality. There's got to be something else going on. And so he decided that there was, behind everything that we experience with our senses, there is some ideal or form that is simply being expressed in those things. I mean, you guys are sitting in blue chairs, right? Mm -hmm. Except you, you're sitting in a very different chair. It's connected to two others. It's got a fold-down seat, right? Um, some of you at home have beanbag chairs. Some of you have um, wicker chairs, or you have kneeling chairs. You have all kinds of different chairs, right? But they're all chairs. <sighs> what is it that makes all those very, very different things all still chairs? Plato would say it's because there is a form, an ideal, of a chair that exists outside the physical world, that is in the mind of God, if you will. Interestingly enough, Socrates, to some extent, and Plato particularly, appear to have been monotheists in a time when everybody else were, were polytheists. Because Plato talks extensively about the mind of God, which he often refers to as the mind of the good. Uh, Plato said, good is the highest good. Meaning, there's no, no better pursuit for you than to achieve what is good. And good is the reflection of the form behind everything. Philosophers are those who seek to understand the form that's behind the physical world. Because he talked about ideals, I'm going to give you an example in a minute, about a couple examples of that. Because he talked about ideals or forms of things that are not in the physical world, they're beyond that. They're in the abstract. That's why he's a mathematician. Mathematics is abstract in its basis. Then he saw, we see his belief, his philosophy, as being called idealism. Some people call it dualism because he said there is the physical world and there is the world beyond the physical world that is more real yet. But dualism means other things in philosophy and so I'm not going to deal with that. Idealism, as you see it up here, idealism is the basic belief. That the thing that is most real is not what you perceive in the physical world, it is something beyond that, that the physical world is just a reflection of. His famous allegory of the cave, if you, may, if you, if you ever took a philosophy class, you'll have studied this. That, um, imagine that all people are like prisoners that are trapped in a cave, and they can't turn their heads, and the only thing they see are shadows on the wall, reflected from a fire somewhere. And they think those shadows are what's real, and then finally one day, one of the prisoners breaks free or is released, and he goes out and he sees the, the things that keep moving back and forth are people carrying things. And he realizes there is a reality much beyond what he perceived. What he perceived were just shadows of the real things. 
That's what Plato said the world was like. What we think is real, the physical world, is only a shadow, just an impression of the ideal truth beyond it. The significance of Plato, Alfred North Whitehead said that all of Western philosophy is simply a set of footnotes to Plato. That he's established the basis for everything else. Now, this idea of forms or ideals, which is the basic premise behind idealism that Plato had, I'll give you a couple of examples that I think will help you understand that. What are those? Really? Those are both the same thing? A Chihuahua and a Great Dane are both dogs? How do you know that? If somebody came from another planet and never seen either of these animals, do you think they would assume they were both the same thing? Well, Plato, in dealing with the ideals behind everything, he, he dealt with one of the basic principles or, or basic challenges of philosophy, and that is the one versus the many. How is it that we have concepts like dog that is one thing, but it is manifested in many, many different kinds of things. And yet, we all naturally understand that they're all still dogs. From a Chihuahua to a Great Dane and everything in between. Including Belgian Malinois, which is what we have. <laughs> okay? How is that? I'll ask you another one. Whoops. What are these? Women. Well, actually, one on the left is a man, but... They're people. Right? How in the world, if somebody landed from an alien planet and looked at these two, would they think they're the same thing? Maybe, maybe not. And yet, you can look at all the differences between this African Maasai warrior and this Scandinavian young woman, and you automatically know they're both people. They are both of one kind, even though they're completely different in every way imaginable. I mean, yes, they have, you know, two eyes, two ears, two nostrils, one mouth, two legs, two arms, but the differences are almost more than the similarity. And yet, we all have a sense that they are both people, even though they're completely different. And how many different versions of people do we have in between that? How many different colors, sizes, shapes, what? This is part of what the kind of thing that prompted Plato to believe that there are forms or ideals behind what we perceive in the real world that ties it all together. And that is more real. Those ideals that are in the mind of God or the mind of the good, they are more real than the physical world. These are just shadows. And you can't trust your senses since your senses are only being able to perceive the shadow world. That a true philosopher, a true thinker, somebody who learns to really perceive is someone who understands much more about that world of the ideals. And that's what idealism is. That reality, the best kind of reality, is not what you perceive with your senses. It's something bigger and, bit, and different than that. Okay, you got that? Plato said a lot more than that. But that's the, the part that I think is most important to us, that he really created idealism. The second philosopher I want to spend a couple minutes talking about is Aristotle. Aristotle was a student of Socrates. In fact, Aristotle spent almost like 19 to 20 years studying in Plato's academy. And then later on, he started his own school called the Lyceum. And whereas Plato was known as di for di his dialectics, meaning he asked questions, got answers, and then they had a conversation back and forth, Aristotle was known as a peripatetic teacher, meaning he walked around a lot. He, he would pace back and forth as he talked about philosophical things with his students, and so he was the founder of the peripatetic school. He has credited Aristotle with the earliest study of formal logic. If you've never studied formal logic, I mentioned to you earlier that there's three basic laws of thought, the law of identity, the law of non-contradiction, the law of the excluded middle. Aristotle is the one that articulated that. Today, if you take a formal logic class at a university level or whatever, they will often call it Aristotelian logic because he's the one that developed all that. He also was a significant contributor to the field of ethics. Arist Aristotle's uh, writings, ethics, is still considered foundational to any ethical consideration in philosophy today. Also science, metaphysics, epistemology, aesthetics, and more. He contributed to virtually every aspect of human thought. Um, I say science. He is the first serious effort to try to categorize 
improvise or uh, sort of create an encyclopedia of life, animal life. He tried to identify all the animals that existed in his part of the world and classify them in their relationship with one another. Now, because he was working 2,300 years ago, he didn't get everything right. Didn't have microscopes, didn't have a lot of this stuff. For instance, in his writings, he says that men have more teeth than women. Doesn't seem that be that hard to figure out, but maybe he just didn't know any women. Um, the, a lot of the things that he said scientifically, we now know were not accurate, but the things he got right, some of the things that he proposed in the 300s BC were verified in the 19th century by modern scientists. He is, again, Plato, Aristotle, Immanuel Kant, probably we'll talk about in future weeks, probably the three greatest philosophers that ever lived, and two of them knew each other. Right? Um, he is known as simply the philosopher by many people. In fact, uh, Thomas Aquinas, who relied heavily on Aristotle, he called him just the philosopher when he quoted him in his materials, in his book. And Aristotle was significantly influential in, to Islam. He is called the first teacher in Islam. Because Islam, during the golden age of Islam, they maintained a lot of the Western writings that when the Western world during the Dark Ages, that is Western Europe, had completely lost them. In fact, between the years 400 or so, when Rome fell, and the year 1000, 600 years later, the period that's called the Dark Ages, and that's not considered politically correct, because the Dark Ages, they, they did a lot of things in agriculture and whatnot, but the fact is that academically it was dark. People learned, people forgot how to read. There were families that had inherited libraries from their parents and grandparents who couldn't read any of the books anymore. And people stopped living in cities and towns because it made you a target for pagan marauders. And so, in terms of any learning, it really was the Dark Ages. During that period of time, almost all of the writings of Aristotle had been lost in the West. They were still being maintained in the Muslim world from the 500s on. And so, they were rediscovered around the year 1000. And Aristotle became influential. He particularly became influential to Thomas Aquinas, we'll talk about, in the 1200s. He was both the student of Plato, and he was also the mentor, the, the tutor and teacher of Alexander the Great. You know, there's a reason he calls him the Great. He conquered almost all the known world at that time. Well, Aristotle was his, his tutor. Aristotle, whereas we look at, at Plato here, as being a mathematician, poet, philosopher, and the creator of idealism, that reality is beyond our senses and you can't trust your senses, Aristotle, after Plato's death, began to disagree with his old teacher. And he developed much more of a scientific approach. He was much more concerned about science and, and paying attention to what your senses say. He believed in the senses. He believed that, that in fact, that form, rather than being some ideal that's off in the mind of God, that the only form that exists is the form that you actually find in matter. And so you perceive it with your senses. Sense experience was critical to Aristotle. He believed that rather than good being the highest good, happiness was the highest good. Again, he is known as the philosopher or the first teacher, and he really is the founder of what we would call materialism. Materialism, in its most drastic case, says that the material world, the physical world, is all that exists. Whereas Plato said the idealism, that the ideals that are beyond the physical world, in the abstract, that they are more important. The materialists would say the physical world is all there is, and so Aristotle went very much in that direction. But again, both of these guys, brilliant, expansive, Aristotle still is a basic text if you're studying ethics, or you're studying uh, metaphysics, or um, logic. He wrote 2,300 years ago, and we still use the stuff he wrote in those fields. Very important. Questions about Aristotle? I told you I'm only going to give you superficial. I want to hit the main points. And the main points here is Plato really developed the idealism that the abstract, something beyond the physical world, is more important. Aristotle focused on materialism. The sense experience, what's in the physical world that you can experience materially, that's what's most important. I now want to go to one of the great doctors of the church, and one of my very favorite people ever, St. Augustine, um, Augie as I like to call him. 
St. Augustine lived in the late 300s, early 400s. He was a bishop of Hippo in North Africa. We forget that North Africa used to be a major center for Christianity. He was bishop of North Africa, um, of, of Hippo in North Africa, and became one of the most influential teachers in the faith. Augustine, by his own account, produced over 230 major works of writing in his life. Um, he is perhaps the greatest Christian theologian, and it depends upon, when I say that, it depends upon whether you're asking a Protestant or a Catholic. Augustine was really rediscovered in significant ways during the Protestant Reformation, and he, much of his teaching and writing, became foundational to the Protestant belief system. The next guy I'm going to talk about for a few minutes, in a few minutes, for a few minutes, is Thomas Aquinas. He is formally accepted as the one who articulated Catholic doctrine. And so the ways in which they differ is pretty much the ways in which Protestantism and Catholicism differ. But Augustine, who lived 1,600 years ago, you read his stuff today, and it feels like somebody just wrote that this year. He also has a good sense of humor. It was Augustine who, when he became a priest, and which of course meant he was celibate, he said, God, make me chaste, but not yet. <laughs> And his, his book, The Confessions, is the world's first autobiography. And that's how timely he is to us today. And you read it today, and it's like you just picked it up at the airport, you know, bookstore. Um, quite extraordinary. It's also true that his other, probably most important book was The City of God, because in the early 400s, when the city of Rome, which was the center of Western Christendom and the center, people felt, of Western civilization, when it was conquered by the pagan hordes who came in, you know, the, the barbarian hordes, much of Western Europe felt like this was the end of the world. It certainly, they thought, was the end of Christendom or the Christian civilization in the West. And when Augustine uh, heard that kind of talk, he responded by writing The City of God, which says, there is a city on earth, the earthly city, which he represented as Rome, and there is the heavenly city, the city of God. Just because the earthly city has been destroyed does not mean the heavenly city is not still available to us. And he, he more than any other single person, kept the Christian faith in Western Europe together during that very difficult time. Now, if, uh, in fact, I, I talked about the, you know, the barbarians coming in. There's a great book I'd recommend to you by Thomas Cahill called How the Irish Saved Civilization. Do we have any Irish in the group? Okay, good for you. Cahill's book is a wonderful read, and it's about the fact that the, the barbarians never got to Ireland, and so the monasteries in Ireland maintained the books, the libraries, the reading, the study, the philosophy, and then later they reintroduced in Western Europe. Cahill does skip one important point, and that is that the, in Byzantium, what we know as Constantinople, or Istanbul today, that they're still main, the, the barbarian pagans didn't destroy that. They maintained culture there, and it kept going. But the Irish did help Western Europe. This is all during the time when Augustine was, was working. It's fair to say that Augustine is the first one. Again, he wrote just 300 years after the time of Christ and the first apostles. And most of the theology, which is taken for granted in Christianity today, simply had not been articulated yet. Much of it was articulated by St. Augustine. And he did so clearly and sensibly. For instance, Augustine said that when it comes to disagreements between your faith and science, I mean, if it appears that something is in contradiction there or doesn't make sense, don't be stupid as a Christian and just just defy all common sense about things because you're not doing any justice to the testimony to Jesus. And you should be ready to modify some of what you believe as you go along if new information comes along. Very modern kind of thinking. Now, that's not to say that he was not a committed Christian. He was, you know, again, he's the one articulated most of modern Christian theology for the first time. And his beliefs were maintained for 900 years until Aquinas as the basis for all of Christian theology. Now, the important thing here, St. Augustine, is to recognize that he really developed a lot of his theological thinking in a combination between what Scripture said and also what Plato had said. Augustine was a Neoplatonic Christian theologian and philosopher. He took the teachings of Plato very seriously, and it affected much of what he said. Part of the theme that Augustine presented was that faith comes before reason. 
He said, I believe so that I might understand. It doesn't mean that he didn't believe in reason. He said that you can't really get to the deepest of truths unless you believe there's something beyond the physical world, unless you believe that there is, there are truths from God that you can only receive by faith, and then you confirm them by reason based upon your experience of the world. This idea that there is some truth coming from outside the material world, faith, if you will, is very platonic. And you all know the expression platonic relationship, right? It means platonic relationship is one that is only ideal in form, but it never has any sort of practical example in the physical world, if you know what I mean. And so this is part of what Platonism was. Um, faith comes before reason, I believe, so that I might understand. This is Augustine. And great fun to read. You would not believe if you read his stuff that it was written 1,600 plus years ago. And the fourth philosopher I want to talk about today, St. Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas came 800 years later. He lived from 1225 to 1274. He was pivotal in Western theology and Western philosophy. He, is called, he has a number of titles from the Catholic Church. And again, um, both of these guys are before the split between Catholicism and Protestantism. So you can't really say the Catholic Church it was the church. But the church identified him as angelic doctor, the prince of scholastics, the universal teacher, the great synthesizer, and believe it or not, the dumb ox. When he, there's a great book called Aquinas the Dumb Ox. It's a biography by G.K. Chesterton, one of my great heroes. When um, Aquinas was a large man, and he moved very slowly, and he talked very slowly. Um, he, whereas Augustine wrote 230 books, Aquinas wrote 80, but that includes the Summa Theologica, which is like multi-volume, very intense kind of scholastic theology. Well, they called him the dumb ox because he moved so slow and talked so slow, but his teacher, Albertus Magnus, Magnus, you know, Albert the Great, he said, someday the bellowing of that dumb ox will shake the pillars of the world. That's when he was still in seminary, and it proved to be true. He was born in 1225. He became a Dominican monk, was later also ordained as a priest. He got a doctorate of philosophy and became a professor of philosophy at the University of Paris. Starting in 1265 through 1273, he wrote his Summa Theological, or the Sum of All Theology, uh, still one of the most important works ever written in the Christian faith, and it is significantly philosophical as much as theological. He died in 1274. He was canonized by Pope John XXII in 1323, declared a doctor of the church, which is one of the highest callings for an academic, in 1567. But here's the important part. In 1879, Leo XIII declared that Thomas, the Thomistic beliefs, are the basis for all Roman Catholic schools. His teaching is the basic teaching for all Roman Catholic schools. And then in 1950, just 66 years ago, um, Pius XII affirmed that Thomism is the guide to Roman Catholic doctrine. So Thomas Aquinas' writing is considered the authoritative guide to what the Catholic Church believes. In the same way that the Protestant Reformation rediscovered Augustine, and he became, you know, one of the great statements, the idea of faith comes before reason, I believe that I might understand. Well, sola fide, faith alone, is one of the great cries of the Protestant Reformation. They get that, not only from Scripture, but also from Augustine. So, Augustine influenced the Protestants. Aquinas became the authority for the Catholics. And I have here the five points, five proofs for God. As a philosopher, Augustine was very involved in metaphysics, philosophy, all kinds of things, ethics, um, also did some scientific work as well, but because in, in the old days, philosophy considered everything. You know, the love of wisdom involved science, the natural sciences, it was called natural philosophy at one point, instead of science. Well, one of the things that, uh, that Aquinas is best known for is he developed five rational proofs for God, using the mind that we can argue for the existence of God. And those are still considered today. The argument from motion, the causation of existence, the contingent and necessary objects, the argument from degrees of perfection, and the argument from intelligent design. You've probably heard of the last one. If you take our apologetics classes or review them in our, um, from our instituto, we get into a lot of those arguments and, and what the premises are on those. Now, here, bottom right corner, we've got Thomas Aquinas. He really saw Aristotle. Remember, he called Aristotle the philosopher in his writing. 
And because he came along in the 1200s during what's called the Scholastic Period, when academics just had a rebirth after the Dark Ages, the Aristotelian writing had been lost until after 1000. And when it became available again, it was very influential. And it especially influenced Thomas Aquinas. He, in the same way that Augustine had applied Neoplatonic thought to Christian theology and philosophy, Aquinas applied Aristotelian thought to Christian philosophy and theology. Contrary to what Augustine said, Augustine said, I believe so that I might understand. Aquinas said, I understand so that I might believe. He thought rationality came first and led to belief. So that reason comes before faith. The opposite of what Augustine said. Well, it's because he's following Aristotle, the idea that I have to examine the things in the world, look at the evidence, look at what my senses tell me, and draw conclusions from that. Now, he still believed that faith was necessary and faith was a gift of God, but he said that reason could start someone on the path toward faith that would lead them there when God finally gave them that faith. Whereas Augustine would have said it's entirely a gift from God, and then that leads me to reason. The opposite, and again, the Summa Theologica is currently available in 21 volumes. A whole library. And he was part of the Scholastic, um, the academic. The Scholastics got a really bad rap, and some, some of it they deserve. Scholastics would argue about how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. You probably heard that. I mean, they, they would write these systematic theologies, like the Summa Theologica, although this one is really worth it. Some of them weren't worth it. And they would go on for a thousand pages about questions like can, can, how many angels can dance on the head of a pen, or whatever the question was. And they became known for being just crazy philosophers. And philosophy got a bad name from that. But that doesn't mean philosophy should have gotten a bad name from that. Now, interestingly, and this is, this is where I'm going to finish today, Plato created idealism, that there is some reality and ideal forms of things beyond the physical world that is more real than the physical world. You can't rely on your senses. Look to the ideals. He developed idealism. That directly influenced the thoughts of St. Augustine, who said faith, the ideal beyond the physical world, starts and leads us to reason. Aristotle, the scientist, the materialist, the material world, what we experience with our senses, is where we start, and from that we develop our understanding of things, was a direct influence on Thomas Aquinas, who said, reason comes before faith. I, I understand so that I might believe. Those two things, for, the first, for one thing, led to the differences in Protestants and Catholics. And it led to a lot of other differences. From this point on, the philosophers we're going to talk about, there are a lot of differences in different ways, but fundamentally it becomes a discussion over whether idealism is right, that there is a truth beyond the physical world, or materialism is right, that the physical world is all that we have, ultimately. And where do those things take us? Because from those beliefs, today, a lot of people will say things that are materialistic, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in anything you can't see, hear, taste, smell, feel. Right? That started with Aristotle, for the most part. And came down from there, and we'll talk about philosophers who believe that. There are others who have said, you can't trust your senses. You know, it is, it's the divine, it's the, the ideal, it's the thing beyond what you can really experience. Those are idealists. And philosophers and people, some of them follow that line. These are the foundations for what we think today, what we say today, and ultimately how we act today. Make sense? Questions? Did I scare you? Okay. Next week we will pick up, we will leave this point of faith, and that is sort of, it's the age of faith, but it's also, where do we put it, what do we rely on? Is it the ideal abstract beyond the physical world, or is it what we experience in the physical world? Idealism or materialism? Next week we will talk about reason. What happens when people start thinking that logic and reason, starting with Rene Descartes and others, I think, therefore I am. Think about what it means if you believe that all reality is dictated by your awareness of yourself. I'll see you next week. Thanks everybody.